Doug is um, obviously uh, an established business um, professional. He was former CEO. He's former CEO at Kraft Foods. The CEO of Borden's, uh, chairman of CEO Best Brands, a long history of leadership in business. He's also an author and teacher, and his special area is in happiness. Um, he teaches a regular course at DePaul, where he's a graduate, and he also does leadership sessions at Canyon Ranch on the skills of happiness, and I think that's what the part um, is related to. So we're very happy to have him here. We're happy to have all of you. And please, uh, don't be a stranger, continue to join us for the last leadership hour. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Kern. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a joy to be here. How many have had a chance to uh, read my book? Because I know a number of you came in and asked for autographs, just out of curiosity. To, to read it. Okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't know why I went dark here. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to speak for maybe 30, 35 minutes. And then I'd like to open it up for questions and go in any direction you all want. Um, and uh, we have any left here? Oh, I hit something on the keyboard there. OK, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see. I probably hit the no. no. All right, the first thing I'm going to talk about is what are we going to talk about this morning and what are we not going to talk about this morning? And what we're not going to talk about is mood. We're not going to talk about plastering a smile on your face. We're not going to find, talk about finding some continuous source of pleasure. We're going to talk about something much different, which is down at the bottom. It's foundational. How do you have an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment that can be there even in times of transition, in times of complexity, in times of, in times of uh, a challenge? I believe genuinely happy people have that kind of ballast in their life. They're able to go through a financial loss and bounce back, a divorce and bounce back, the loss of a job and bounce back. They keep coming back to an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment. They understand that anger, grief, remorse, and uh, denial and jealousy, they're all stages. They aren't permanent places of residence. Where they reside is an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment. When I was a kid, I had a punching bag. I could punch it, go over, hell, it would come back up, and it would go, I could drop it out of a second floor window, and it would still come back up. And I think genuinely happy people have that kind of ballast in their life, that they can go through things and come back. Maybe not as quick as my Mickey Mouse punching bag, but they still come back to an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment. And the fundamental model that we're going to use today is one that I think that people that have that kind of ballast have a perspective about three things. And the first is how they remember the past. What's ever happened to them in the past, they've learned from it and they've let it go. They don't carry around a whole lot of anger, a whole lot of remorse, a whole lot of guilt. They've learned from the past and then they've let it go. The second thing they've got is they've got confidence about the future. As they look to the future, they recognize they have a role and they prepare for the future, but they also realize they can't control the future. And when they step into the future, it will always, always be different than they anticipated. But it will always, 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 always bring them what they need. Not necessarily what they want, but it will bring them what they need. So they focus on what can I do, and then they move with the future. And if they can do those two things, that they have confidence about the future and have peace about the past, then they can live in the present where so much joy is found. But I don't know about you all, I spent so much of my life agonizing about crap about the past that I could do nothing about, worrying about the future and what the future, future would bring, that I failed to live in the present and experience, uh, experience joy. So what I'm going to share today is a set of skills. There's 13. I don't have time to go through them all. They're on your card. I'll just sample some of them and talk about some of the more important ones. But we're going to talk about skills that people have that enable them to do that. Um, some people practice this subliminally. That is, it just comes naturally to them. The Dalai Lama doesn't need my little card, right? He lives with joy, okay? He does, I need this card. I put it on my mirror and I think, okay, today I'm going to be more forgiving. Today I'm going to be more grateful. Whatever it is, I pick out one of the skills and I, tr I try to practice it. Uh, and by the end of the day, I hope I have convinced you that uh, these are skills. The second thing I want to share with you before I get into the presentation is that here's the four things that I hope you walk away from with today. The first is everyone and everything, every single person wants to be happy. There are no exceptions to this. If you know somebody who doesn't want to be happy, please see me after class because researchers here at Audubon would like to study this person in detail. The second thing is it underlies every single decision that you make. Whether it go to school, not go to school. Give money, don't give money. Take a job, don't take a job. You're making the decision based on you think it'll eventually bring you greater happiness. It's what philosophers call an ungrounded grounder. 
why did you go to Otterbein to get a good education? Why do you want a good education? Because I want to get a good job. Why do you want to get a good job? Because I can provide for my family. Why do you want to provide for your family? Because it'll make me happy. You can't go any further. That's the foundation of every single decision that you make, everyone and everything. The second is it's worthy of, of talking about this subject. People that live with joy do so much better in almost every single aspect of life. They have better relationships. They do better at work. College students in the top quartile of happiness versus the bottom quartile, when they graduate, make 20% more money. And 30 years later, they're making 50% more money. It isn't a question of whether money buys happiness. It's happiness does buy money. You do better, and the reason you do better is not because you're chasing after the dollars, but because you do better in work. You're more enjoyable. People flock to you. You make a better teammate. You make a better leader. It's worthy of studying this subject of happiness. You actually have better health and you live about 19% longer versus the bottom quartile in terms of happiness. The third thing I want you to walk away with is it's hard. It's hard to be happy, particularly when the world seems to be moving against you. Let's face it, it's easy to be miserable. What's hard is to face the world with joy when it's moving against you. And the last thing I want to take, you to take away is it is a skill. In fact, it's a set of skills. I've identified 13 skills. I'm sure there's 30 more skills that, that are out there, but I'm going to talk about uh, 13 skills today, or at least uh, show you the 13 skills that uh, we're going to talk about. Am I going too fast? You all with me so far? Too fast, too slow, too loud, too soft, too funny, not funny enough? Um, OK, uh, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to connect with you all. There's an expression which is when you, make, when you talk to people, you want to have context and connection before content. So before I really get into the deep content of it, I'd like to connect with you by sharing with you the uh, just a summary. It'll take me about seven or eight minutes of the first four chapters of the book. And by doing that, I think you'll understand why I'm standing behind you, in front of you. Because 10 years ago, if you told me I was going to be talking about this subject, I would have thought you were nice. All right, here we go. You ready? <coughs> Chapter one. Chapter one is called Sunrise from One Pi White Pine Mountain. I've come to our home at the north end of Lake George in upstate New York along the border of Vermont in November of 2012. It's deserted. There's nobody around. The tourists have all since left. I have the place to myself. I'm there for 10 days of solitude to read, write, meditate, reflect. I have a very understanding wife. As I have most mornings, I've hiked the mountain behind our house called White Pine Mountain to watch the sun rise over the eastern shore. This is the view from the top of White Pine Mountain. I have a heavy sweater on and a heavy coat as the chill of the impending winter overwhelms my, the warmth of my fading summer memories. As I sit on this ledge watching the sun rise over the eastern shore, I am filled with an incredible sense of awe and gratitude for being here. By here, I suppose I mean this particular spot on this particular day. But in a much deeper sense, I realize that awe and gratitude are the overwhelming sensations in my life. It seems like dozens of times a day I stop and give thanks to God just for the privilege of being alive. I haven't always felt this way. For the vast majority of my life, I look back and I think I've been a selfish little nerd, complaining, moaning, whining that the universe will not bend itself to my particular whims and desires. The sun comes out from behind a cloud, shimmers on the water, and I contemplate the weird irony of the events some eight years earlier that have led me to this incredible sense of awe and gratitude. Chapter two is called The Long Ride Home. It's a little more difficult than chapter one, but it has everything to do with the subject of happiness. It's September 2004, and I'm sitting in a hematologist's office at the Mayo Clinic. I've gone through two days of testing as a result of some rather strange blood test results back here in Columbus and an even stranger MRI. They can seem to find nothing wrong. I'm about to leave with a clean bill of health, and just like in the movies, the phone rings. The doctor picks up the phone, listens for a few minutes, hangs up, turns to me ever so slowly, and says, not sure how to tell you this, but you have blood cancer. You have a slow developing, but an incurable form of blood cancer. That's when I ask the question. I am sure it's on the question, question that's on anybody's mind at that particular time, but a question you really do not want to know the answer to. How long before this illness takes my life? He answers in generalities, and before I have the courage or the wisdom to withdraw the question, I hear him say, based on your pathology report, I'd say five to 10 years, but nobody knows for sure. I'm supposed to spend the night in Minneapolis, but the idea of spending the night in a hotel room scares the hell out of me. So I decide to make the 14-hour drive to, to Columbus overnight. Cell phones can be absolutely wonderful things. My wife and I have been on this journey for 35 years together. Tonight will be no exception. She's not sleeping, I'm driving, so we talk on the cell phone. First, my response is pretty primitive. Make this illness go away. It must be somebody else's results. My wife lovingly tries to get uh, me to elevate my, my thinking. Around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I share with her a memory I have as a little boy, five or six years old, in Scotia, New York. 
in my bedroom and it's February and it's snowing outside and my mom comes in to say the prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's when I ask her the question as well. What does it mean to die? She tells me, doesn't sound good. The neighbor's dog had died a few weeks earlier and that didn't make them any too happy. <laughs> I am unconsolable at the concept of my own mortality. And now as I drive through the night, 54 years later, I realize I have no better idea of how to deal with my own mortality than I did when I was four or five years old. I arrive the next morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. My wife greets me with tears in her eyes, a smile on her face, and I realize I am not alone. Chapter 3 is called a blank calendar. Have you ever wanted a blank calendar? I was CEO of an organization. I went to the board and I said, I'm going to resign. I shared with them my uh, diagnosis. And uh, they asked me to stay on a chairman. This could be the best piece of advice I share with you this morning. If anybody ever, ever asks you to be chairman, for God's sake, take the job. From my perspective, you do absolutely nothing, and yet it still sounds really good at a cocktail party. <laughs> I become chairman of the organization. I have a blank calendar. Not, there's a couple of chairmen in the room, and I think I have a blank calendar. You can, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for ad infinitum. I think, it's a, I think it's a blessing. It is an incredible curse. Within about three or four weeks, I'm deeply depressed. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't make any decision. The idea of paper or plastic at the end of the grocery line scares the hell out of me. I go to Canyon Ranch, I spend a couple of weeks there, I work my way out of the depression. When I come out of the depression, I realize I am a person who needs something to devote my life to. I need something to occupy my humble talents. But the question is, to what purpose? And that's resolved in chapter four, and I'll just summarize it for you briefly. DePaul had been after me to teach a course in leadership, so I said yes, I'd do that during the winter term. And uh, uh, I'm working on the, the course, and I read a book called What Happy People Know by Dan Baker. It's an excellent book. And I read the book and I say, damn, that's what we gotta teach. For the students, all the options have gone up. Internet, sex, drugs, et cetera. All the options have gone up, all the restrictions have come down. They're overwhelmed in terms of what really leads to joyful, meaningful, fulfilling life. Where, they, where, where do they get answers to this? So I decided, I called upon and I said, I wanna teach a course in leadership. I'd like to teach something else. They said, what? I said, happiness. There's silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> Eventually, they said, put a syllabus together. We'll take a look at it and then go away. I didn't go away. I put a syllabus together. And I think more out of curiosity than anything else, they let me teach the course. I had 500 students last year sign up for 30 spots. It's become the, the most This subject is one that is definitely on the student's mind and ought to be in every uh, sing single school. Uh, at the end of the class, I have 27 students. I have them four hours a day, four days a week for four weeks, because they only take one course during the month of January. 27, 20 of the 27 hand me personal letters, some of them three and four pages long. And a group of them go to see the president of the school and tell them every student at the party needs to take the course. Six months later, I teach at Canyon Ranch. Now I'm not talking to students, 18 to 22 year olds, I'm talking to very successful people in their 50s and 60s and 70s. I don't change a single story. The result is equally positive. I go to the airport. Now I'm feeling like a peacock. I realize I seek approval far more than I really should. I'm feeling really good. I get to the airport, I upgrade to first class. I think I deserve it. I get, I'm like a peacock with my feathers all fluffed up. I sit out on the airplane. There's nobody sitting next to me. They can probably see the feathers. And I get on the airplane, and just about the time the airplane takes off, I hear this little voice that says, Doug, what? I guess you fooled them, huh? What do you mean I fooled them? They loved it. They loved it. They liked it okay. But you talked about 13 skills of happiness. How many of them do you practice? Oh, I'll leave you alone. I know a lot about the. I didn't ask if you knew about the subject. I asked how many of you practice. I asked the steward for a glass of wine, thinking maybe that will make the voice go away. Of course, it doesn't. Bugs me all the way, because we all know, conscience is a mother-in-law whose visit never, never ends. <laughs> this, bu this voice bugs me all the way back to Columbus. And by the time I come back to Columbus, I've written three things on a piece of paper. Understand what are the skills that really lead to joyful, meaningful, fulfilling life. Number two, practice those skills more consistently. And number three, share that story with as many people as I possibly can. I go around the country and I do this for schools, I do it for organizations, for corporations, I teach at Canyon Ranch on an ongoing basis. Um, and when I, when I go, I say, hey, I, I'm, 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 I'm free, but I'm not cheap. And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, the only thing you have to do for me is pay my transportation. But uh, you also have to make a meaningful donation to the James Cancer Center or the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And so far, it's raised a million and a half dollars for our uh, cancer research. So it's a uh, joy to be here today. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. So now you know why I'm here. And that's also why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for two reasons. One is to share the story, and the other is to make me practice the skills more consistently, because I'm great at talking about them, but less, less capable of uh, practicing it. All right, here we go. 
Here's the 13 skills. There's two that deal with the past, forgiveness and gratitude. Four that deal with the future that I call FOFO, faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness. And then seven skills that deal with the present. I'm just going to talk about a few of the skills. I'll share with you the first one in a little bit of detail because forgiveness is probably the most difficult and probably the most important skill of uh, happiness. And, I, and I, here's how I do this. I do this through a story, then I give you the concept, then I give you the tools. So I'm going to start with a story um, about uh, my wife and I. And uh, uh, I'm going to start with uh, the first slide, which is the first skill, which uh, first perspective, which is a perspective of peace about the past. My wife's name is Phyllis, but I call her Sparky. Sparky and I were married in 1969 in Baltimore, Maryland. I had my first job at General Mills in, White, in uh, Minneapolis as assistant product manager on Bisquick baking mix. We're going to drive from Baltimore to Minneapolis. When I get in the car, I want to get there. She likes to stop and see things. One of the things she's always wanted to see is Niagara Falls. We're going to drive about 20 miles south of Niagara Falls, so I say, yeah, we'll stop. She falls asleep around Rochester. I don't want to wake her up. I keep driving. She eventually wakes up. She says, where are we? I said, we're just west of, uh, of uh, Erie. She quickly realizes that we pass Niagara Falls. I'll save you the conversation. We just get short of Cleveland, and I drive three and a half hours back to Niagara Falls. <laughs> we get to Niagara Falls around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's nobody in the parking lot. It's absolutely deserted. I can't figure that out. Why are they deserted? So we walk down to Niagara Falls, and this is what we see. There is no water coming over the American side of Niagara Falls. I don't know if any of you all remember this or know this. Anybody remember this? In 1969, they built a dike across the American side to divert the water because they wanted to take all these boulders out from underneath. So there's no water. Sparky makes a perfectly logical suggestion. Let's go over to the Canadian side. There'll be more water coming over the I said, get in the car. We're going to Minneapolis. And we drove in silence from the Niagara Falls mud hole all the way to Minneapolis, our first major, major fight. Okay. Now, 43 years later, if you say the words Niagara Falls to my wife, she smiles. And in fact, she could smile a couple of weeks afterwards. And both of us could laugh about what a jerk I was. And I was a jerk. But both of us could laugh about it. And I didn't realize it then. Oh, I really wish we had, because we would have practiced it in so many other regards. But we were practicing the skill of forgiveness. And it is a skill. In fact, it's two very separate skills. She was practicing the skill of, of, of forgiving somebody else. If you say something nasty to me, OK, I'm going to hold it here. And at some point in the future, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to say, you remember when you did this to me six months ago? Or I'm going to go tell all your friends about it. Or I'm going to some way try to strike back at you. And being able to say, I forgive you, and not just say it, but be able to release that desire for any kind of vengeance. So no matter what it is, I'm not going to be trying to strike back at you is an incredible skill. And it's the forgiveness of other people. The other skill is the skill that I was practicing, which is a skill of self-esteem which is a skill of forgiving myself, which is, hey, I'm worthy of being able to make a mistake. I'm worthy of being able to learn from it. I'm worthy of happiness. So I'm worthy of letting this go and moving on with my life. Two very, very separate skills. You can be good at one, good at both, good at neither. They're two very different skills. In general, I find women have a lot of trouble forgiving themselves and are pretty good at forgiving others. Men, they're great at forgiving themselves and not so for good at uh, forgiving, <laughs> forgiving others. There's four things you can do with crap that happens to you in the past. One is you can forget about it. It's great if it happens. Sparky and I are never going to forget about Niagara Falls. It's just part of who we are. The second thing you can do is you can repress it. You can tell yourself to forgive it. And, and, and invariably, it comes back in very uh, negative ways. The third thing you can do is you can hold on to it. So if Kara, uh, Kara is that how you say it? If Kara says something nasty to me, I'm going to carry it around or tell somebody else. I just hold, hold on to it. The fourth thing you can do is you can forgive. It's the only thing that lets you get junk out of your life. It's like Tide. It gets the dirt out of your life. The fact that it leads to happiness is simple arithmetic. You're taking negative things in your life and putting them uh, behind you. I had a woman at Canyon Ranch. This, I just came back from Canyon Ranch on Sunday. And I had a woman out there who came up to me after we talked about forgiveness. And she said, uh, does it help if I do something? And I said, yeah, it helps if you write a letter, you call the person or something else. I see her the next morning. She's got tears in her eyes and a smile on her face. She says, I took your advice. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I called this woman that I've been angry at for 40 years. And I called her and I told her I, for I forgave her. I talked in generalities, but I told her I forgave her. And she said, I feel so much better today. She's carried this for 40 years. Now, you all, I, my guess is you all got things that you carry around with you for the past 40 years, or students for the past 10 years or 15 years, that you've carried with you as well that you really don't need to carry around with you. Forgive yourself. Forgive other people. 
Um, my wife and I have a, the, the tool I want to two tools. One is real simple, which is my wife and I have a thing which is we call dump the garbage, which is if we do something to hurt one another, we try to deal with it within 48 hours. And the reason we call it dump the garbage is because this stuff is like garbage. You put in, you know, somebody does something to me, I say something, I hold on to it, I carry it around with me, and it really does start to stink after a period of time. And what we're trying to do is get it out of our life. So in 48 hours, we try to do it. The other is a thing called the REACH process, which is by a weather fellow by the name of Everett Worthington. If, you, if you're really interested in forgiveness, Everett Worthington is probably the expert in uh, 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 forgiveness. And here's, here's what he says. He says, recall the event. R stands for recall. Recall the event. Okay, I understand when it happened, what it is, sort of recall. Empathize with the person, whether it's you or somebody else, empathize. Gee, I was really young then. I didn't really know things I know now. Gee, maybe they didn't understand where it was, but try to empathize with the person. The third is give the altruistic gift of forgiveness. It has nothing to do with justice. It has nothing to do with whether they want forgiveness or ask for forgiveness or care about forgiveness. You want to get it off of your, you want to get it out of your life. Commit to it in some kind of way. Call them up, write them a letter, do something. If it's your parents and they've long passed, write them a letter and put it away someplace. But do some, some, make some kind of commitment. And the H stands for hold on because these things tend to crack back, creep back into your life at, uh, at one point or another. Um, Everett Worthington, probably the expert on uh, forgiveness. Gratitude, I don't have time to cover, but it's just the opposite. What you're doing with gratitude is you miss a thousand opportunities a day to be grateful. And what you're doing with, when you have gratitude is you're pulling good things into your life. If you do nothing more than at the end of the day, say, what are the three things I'm thankful for? If you do that for 30 days, you'll be measurably happier, happier as a result of having done that. Take time to be grateful for the things that we've got. Uh, Tom. Uh, Mal Maliazzi, who's the click or clack of, uh, to of, uh, of car talk, just passed away. And he had, a, he had a formula for happiness. He says, happiness equals life minus expectations. Ooh. Powerful. To the degree your expectations are high, you're going to have less, you're going to have less happiness. To the degree that you're just grateful for so many things that surround you, you're going to have much, much more uh, happiness. All right, you all with me so far? I'm going to talk about the future. Am I going too fast? OK, everybody with me? All right. I have 50 pounds of manure for a five pound sack. Because remember, I teach this four days a week, four hours a day for, uh, at the DePaul. Um, OK, I'm going to talk about four skills, faith, optimism, flexibility, and, uh, and openness. And I'm going to do that through talking about a little bit more about my family. This is a graduation ceremony at DePaul. That's Sparky next to me. That's our youngest son, uh, Greg. I haven't mentioned. Um, yeah, I'll tell you one thing about forgiveness. My, uh, my youngest son got married to a woman that uh, 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 several years ago uh, that had a difficult past, and very quickly she folded back into that difficult past, and she really hurt him. And uh, he got divorced after a couple of years. And the day the divorce was finalized, Sparky came to me and said, uh, "We need to write. Uh, I'll call her Mary. We need to write Mary an email." And I said, "Write Mary an email? Are you nuts?" She says, "No. We need to put this behind us. We need to write Mary an email." So I type better than her, so I sat down at the type computer. I go, dear bitch, I hope you rot in hell. She says, no, no. She said, I, she said no, no, we're not going to write that kind of email. I said, no, this feels really good. It feels good. She said, no, we're not going to write that kind of email. And we ended up writing an email that said, uh, we really appreciate the good times we have. We really appreciate the way you've treated our other son, uh, Gordon. Uh, we wish you nothing but the best in the future. And if you see us in town, you can count on us for a hug and a, uh, and a smile. And I signed it. My oldest son, Gordon, signed it. And my wife, Spikey, signed it. And we sent it off to her. And I know what she was trying to do, which was trying to take a concrete action to try to, try to put this uh, behind us. The next story I want to tell you is about my older son, Gordon. This is him and me. Uh, he looks like me, but he dresses better, obviously. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is share a story about the Gordon. He's an absolute joy. He's 43 years old. And I couldn't ask for a better son. But I want to share a story about his, uh, his birth. Uh, we moved to White Plains. Uh, we moved to New Canaan, Connecticut, and I had a job at White Plains as assistant product manager on Tang Instant Breakfast Drink, the one that went to the moon in 1970. And uh, in November of 1970, we discovered that uh, Sparky is pregnant. She does everything you should do to have a perfectly normal child. She eats well. She exercises appropriately. She doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke. Uh, and on July 9th, 1971, we go to see the movie Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman and Faye Dunaway. We come home, she doesn't feel well. Two o'clock in the morning, she really doesn't feel well. We call the doctor, takes her into the hospital. He misdiagnoses placenta separata, gives her an emergency cesarean, and our son, uh, Gordon, was born. Gordon wasn't ready to be born. His lungs weren't uh, fully developed, and he has a breathing difficulty, 
and uh, within hours he is uh, left uh, mentally handicapped. Now for years I agonized about my son's future. Will he ever be able to walk? Will he ever, till he walk? Will he ever talk? Till he talk? Will he ever be able to go to normal school? Will he ever hold down a job? Will he ever be able to get married? I agonized about every aspect of Gordon's future. And what I really agonized was agonizing about was my future and how it was going to affect me. And sometime when Gordy, when his mid-teenage years, I started to look at Gordy differently, I realized what he lacks in IQ, he more than makes up in EQ. We've moved around a lot as a family. Every place we've moved, the person they miss the most is our son, Gordon. There is nothing I'm doing that he doesn't say, I'll help you, Dad. He lives with us today. He works at uh, Kroger as a bagger um, and uh, uh, lives with us in a couple of rooms over our garage. And he is an incredible joy. But I realize now, as I look back on it, I needed four skills as I look to the future. And I'll cover them real quickly. Faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness. Faith is belief in the future. That's a conviction that stands on its own without proof. It's the ability to look forward to the future and have confidence about the future. You can develop through, through meditation. You can develop through organized religion. You can develop all kinds of different ways, but you need faith in the future. Without faith, cool, uh, imagination will be a cruel master and will spin all kinds of negative scenarios. The second thing you need is you need optimism. Optimism and happiness correlate almost one to one. And people that are optimistic deal so much better with setbacks because they think about them very differently. And we can get into this in more detail if, during the question period if it's, if it's worth it. But they think about setbacks very differently than pessimistic people. Optimistically, people think about a setback as being temporary, specific, and controllable. When you're thinking pessimistically, you think it's permanent, you think it's pervasive, and you think it's absolutely uncontrollable. There's nothing I can do about it. The last two things you need is you need uh, flexibility and openness. Uh, here's, here's, here's the premise. The premise is much of the stress in your life is caused by your fixed notion of how the future will un unfold and your inability to adjust to the very diversions that the universe will invariably take. It's your fixed notion of the future. Most of us see the future. I'm here. I want to go over here. And so we see this pathway forward, but we see one pathway forward. And the truth is, the second we step into the future, it's invariably going to be different. And so what most of us do, we say, oh, damn it, I did everything I'm doing. How, what? We get all bent out of shape as opposed to saying, OK, I'm here. How do I get bent back a path to go over there? There's a million pathways that lead from x to y, OK? And we have one pathway forward. And having the flexibility to adjust to different pathways is exceedingly important. The other is, you may end up in a different place altogether, OK? And you must be open to being in a new place. You get rejected from a particular school, and you have to go to a different school. Being able to adjust to that, open, being open to new destinations and new places. If I was still hung up on Gordon being the son that I envisioned before he was born, I would miss so much joy that he has to offer to me, to Sparky, and to our other son, uh, uh, Greg. Faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness in terms of, uh, of facing, facing the future. Um, there's an innocence about my son, um, Gordon, that I absolutely love. Uh, he and I walk a lot of mornings. If he's not working at Kroger that day, he and I walk. We walk down to a fitness center. Then we go over to a Starbucks. Uh, I read the paper. He can read enough so he can sort of figure out the scores. And then we walk home. A couple of years ago, we're walking, and this beautiful woman stepped out of her house. She's probably 35 or 40 years old. And she says, hi, Gordon. How are you? Gordon says, hi, Mrs. Miller. How are you? And we walked on about another 30 or 40 yards. And Gordon leans over to me and says, I bagged Mrs. Miller. And I said, I said, I said, excuse me? He said, I begged Mrs. Miller and Kroger. And I, go, I just started to roar inside as I thought about this. Uh, I thought about uh, the more crass, sexist, uh, uh, filthy uh, interpretation of uh, bag Mrs. Miller that, of course, immediately jumped into my mind versus uh, what jumped into uh, Gordy's mind. Um, there was, there was, just this other day, there was an incident which, is really, uh, which really demonstrates Gordy's EQ. Uh, he has a job coach. And the job coach told us about this woman that had come through the line. And he was working on one line. He's supposed to move over to another. So he was over here. And she tells the cashier, I want paper. I don't want plastic. So Gordy moves over. He hadn't heard that. So he's supposed to pack them in plastic unless they have a preference. So he starts packing them in plastic. And they get about four or five bags filled. And then she turns and sees that they're being packed. She says, I told you I want them in plastic. And she starts ripping the bags out, you know, and sort of just goes, goes bonkers there. So Gordy comes home that night. And I only heard this from the job coach. So Gordy comes home that night, and I said, did anything happen at work today? He said, no, no, everything's fine. I said, nothing exciting happened? He said, no, no, everything's fine. And so I went on for a conversation. And I realized, in his mind, this was not his problem. 
He was not going to take this on. He was letting this go by him as opposed to hang on to it. And it's, it's her problem. It's not my problem. We take, somebody's in a bad mood at work and really grumpy. So what do we do? We go around and tell everybody around. We carry it around with him. And he's just letting it all go by him. He's not picking up this crap that people throw around and hanging on to it. He's letting it go by him. And I'm just so proud of him. I never, I never even talked to him about it. I was just so proud of his ability to sort of let that go by and, <coughs> and move on and not carry it with him. All right. I am going to talk about, uh, I'll talk just about the first skill real clearly, which just is my simple way of saying doing now what you're doing now is my simple way of saying be present. Have your head be where your feet are. Most of us are thinking about things in 20 different directions and always multitasking. Multitasking is the enemy of happiness. Be present where you are. A real simple tool to do this is a thing called thresholds. When you pass through a doorway, I want you to think of this threshold. So when you pass through this doorway in here, I want you to focus what's going on in this room. Not about your class at 10 o'clock, not what's happening at the office, not about the traffic that's coming home. When you pass through at nighttime, when you pass through the garage door, and you pass through the door from the garage into the house, think about be present in the home as opposed to worrying about the office and worrying about the other stuff. I said to the woman that was helping me, I said, well, I, I usually do work at home. She said, that's fine. You have an office at home? And I said, yeah. She said, pass through another threshold. Pass through another doorway into your office. Your family will know that when you're in there, you really need to focus on your work. What I don't want you to do is sit in front of the TV, talk to your kids, do your office work, read the paper, try to do all those things at a time. I want you to do one thing at a time. This is really tough for us today, particularly with all the technology that's out in terms of telephones and everything else that uh, will drive you uh, absolutely nuts and distract you in all kinds of uh, different ways. Be where you are. Do now what you Happiness is found in the present, but you've got to be present in order to find it. All right, I'm just going to talk about the last two, and then I'll open up for questions. Um, and the way I'd like to do this is I want to show you a brief clip from the movie Castaway by, with Tom Hanks. How many saw Castaway? Uh, OK, excellent. I'm going to show you a two-minute clip to bring it back. There are three major props in the movie. I think I'll have time to talk about all three, but there are three major props. I'm sure there's lots more, but there's three major props that I'd like to talk about. I want you to tell me what the props are after you see the... Uh, little two-minute uh, video. Are you ready? The watch, okay, excellent, excellent. The, the watch, Wilson, excellent. And the last? What does he keep with him all the time? What's that? FedEx package. FedEx package. Excellent, excellent. FedEx package, the ball, Wilson, and, uh, and the watch. Um, let, me, let me talk about them uh, briefly, uh, each, each one. And I think, because I think they represent the cores to uh, successful living, and in fact, they set the cores to happiness. Package. He's a FedEx employee. All these packages wash up on the beach. He opens all of them. Uh, there's, a, there's a tutu skirt. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, a ice skate that he turns into an axe. He uses everything almost that's in the packages. And the last box he comes to, he starts to open it, and he stops. And he doesn't open it. He puts it aside. Why? I think he's a FedEx employee. He said, damn it all, I'm going to figure out a way to get off this island, and I'm going to deliver this package. I think the package represents purpose, purpose in life. Exceedingly important. Figure out how to have meaningful purpose in your life. The second is Wilson. Wilson is a soccer ball or a volleyball. I forgot what he's got. Bloody handprint. He makes a face out of it. He ends up putting hair and, you know, putting uh, palm leaves into it as a face. He talks to it all the time. He keeps it with him every place he goes. He leaves, he takes the FedEx box, and he takes Wilson with him. And do you remember there's a scene in the movie where, where the ball drifts away from him and, and it's off the raft, and he takes and he takes a rope. It's really a videotape, but he's got this rope that goes back, and he just can't quite get to Wilson. He's got to make a decision. Am I going to let go of this and save Wilson, in which case I'm going to drown, or am I going to go back to the raft? And he really agonizes, and he lets Wilson drift away. And after that, he's finished. He just basically lies on the raft. He has no more energy for anything. It's just he's basically finished. And I think the ball represents the importance of effective, enduring relationships in our life. He needed somebody to be in relationship to. Let me talk about him real quickly. Victor, there's, there's three Viennese schools of psychology. The first is um, uh, Freud, who came along and said, man's basic search is for pleasure. Adler comes along and says, no, no, no. Man's basic search is for power. Viktor Frankl survives the concentration camp, and only one out of 28 survived the concentration camp. He observed who survived, and he said they all had something yet they wanted to do with his life, with their life. And he concluded, man's basic search is for meaning. It's for purpose. If he figures that out, so many other things will come into play. 
Um, it's different challenges at different times. For students, I think it's figuring out a, a purpose. So what is your purpose? And I use a quote which is where your deep gladness, your deep understanding, and the world's deep hunger come together. Where your deep gladness, what do you love doing? Where your deep understanding, to me, is what you're skilled at. And the world's deep hunger, which is need, come together. And if you can figure out the bullseye of those things, you're going to be ever so much happier in life. When I was in college, I loved to play soccer. The world needs great soccer players. I wasn't very good. Okay, The circles don't work. Today, I love the topic of happiness and leadership. I, love, I think I'm pretty good at telling score, stories. Like my son Gordon, I have more EQ than I got IQ. And I think the world deeply, deeply needs the subject in terms of what leads to joyful, meaningful living. When you're in midlife, the challenge is much different. I think the challenge is, how do I pursue this without sacrificing this? Because I don't know about you, over and over again in my life, you all that have been in business for a while or been pursuing a career, I traded this off for this. I never figured out until the end how to successfully integrate them. And I think I know the reason why, because most of us are goal-oriented people. We do things, we ship a product, we get a new client, we put together a proposal. There are things that we can check off. This seems to take care of itself until it doesn't. And figuring out how to integrate these two things is exceedingly important. When my youngest son was eight years old, I came home one night and he said, Dad, I think we need a suggestion box. I said, OK. So he makes up a little suggestion box. And I came home the next night. And I sat down at dinner, and Greg says, I think there's a suggestion in the suggestion box. <laughs> so I said, OK. So I went out in the hallway, and I got the uh, uh, suggestion box. We're talking about purpose and relationship. So in the suggestion box was this. And that sticky has been on my mirror for 25 years now. And you think you have a better sign that says, hey, Stupo, you ought to try to be present at home. You, ought to, you shouldn't be trading off this for this all the time. And still, I traded off relationships for purpose. And later in life, the challenge becomes, how do, you, how do you transition a purpose? I think that was a challenge I felt when I gave up my CEO things. Purpose and relationships, figure these two things out, and your life is ever so much more successful. I'll just talk about relationships for, for a couple minutes. There's a th here's a number for you, 140. Your mind is capable of handing 140 bits of information per second. So if Kara and I are having a ca casual conversation, okay, casual conversation takes about 40 bits of information per second. Okay? So I've got 100 bits of information. That's really free if I'm having a casual conversation. So what do I do? I think about the future. Maybe I'll text somebody. Maybe I'll interact with somebody else. But I'll take and I'll divert. I'm not going to waste 100 bits of information, right? It only takes 40 to have a casual conversation. But if you take all 140 bits of information and devote it to one person, it has incredible, incredible power. Nobody does it. And if you take the 140 bits of information and devote it to your kids, to your spouse, to your parents, to fellow students, if you take all 140 bits of information, your relationships will be ever so much stronger and ever so much more healthy. When you're talking to somebody, try to use 140 bits of information to, to, uh, to, give, to give the person. Um, the last thing is the, uh, the watch. And the watch is, the, uh, is what I call the one thing. And I have a chapter in the book called The One Thing. And I think I can bring this up. I'll show you this brief video. Uh, you all may, may remember this. Cowboy leads a different kind of life when there were cowboys. They're a dying breed. Still means something to me, though. A couple of days, they'll move this herd across the river, driving through the valley. Oh, <laughs> there's nothing like bringing in a herd. See, now that's great. Your life makes sense to you. <laughs> What's so funny? You city folk, you worry about a lot of shit, don't you? Shit? Yeah. My wife basically told me she doesn't want me around. Is she read it? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, how old are you? 38. 39. Yeah. You all come up here about the same age, same problems. Spend about 50 weeks a year getting knots in your rope, and then, and then you think two weeks up here will time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean shit. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you got to figure out. The one thing. 
I think the watch represents the one thing. And I think the one thing is love. And I think it's the key to life, and it's also a key to, key to happiness. Your life, will be, most, most of our lives are driven by two things, two fears. One is I won't be enough, and the other is I won't have enough. And those two fears drove me for the vast majority of my life. They got me to get up in the morning. They got me to be successful in so many different ways. But they're still fears. They're fears of I won't be enough. I've got to get the next job. I've got to get the next title. I won't have enough. I've got to get the next home. I've got to get the next, next car. I've got to do something. I won't be enough or I won't have enough. And if your leadership is driven and your life is driven by those two things, it's self-serving. And there's another way to look at leadership and there's another way to look at life, which is, hey, I'm here to help other people as well as help myself, but I'm here to help other people. If you lead an organization and you can figure out how to benefit the employees, benefit the customers, benefit the suppliers, benefit the uh, communities within which you operate, benefit the owners, it's an ever so much better way to lead. And it's leading with love versus fear. It's care of yourself, it's care of others, and it's care of place. It's a whole other subject and a whole other area to go into in, in more detail. But I think at the core of happiness is a life based on love. It's a love of life and a life of love. Um, what I'd like to do is open it up for questions and go in any direction you want. And then I've got maybe two or three minutes I'd like to, to share with you at the end. But I'd love to hear from you all in terms of questions you've got about the uh, 13 skills. And I'll put them up here, uh, ones that we have covered or haven't covered, or um, uh, if I can address anything that's on your, on your mind. So with that, it's open to questions. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Oh, nice. Thank you. Why is it hard to be happy in today's society? Oh. Um, I think it's I think in general. Here's my here's here's my answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Why is it so happy? Why is it so hard to be happy in today's society? A um, couple reasons. Number one, I think happiness is hard. I don't think it's I don't think these these skills are easy to practice. So I think it's always been hard, somewhat hard to. Uh, to be uh, happy. Um, the second is I think that uh, technology not only does things for us, it does things to us. And I think we are so distracted in so many different directions and have so many things bombarding us all the time, most of which don't really lead to happiness and lead to joyful living, that I think we oftentimes uh, get distracted. When I taught this at DePaul and I talked about being in the present, I think most of us are not in the present. Um, the students came back the next morning and they said, uh, a group of students, there were like eight uh, women that had gone out for a dinner together, and they said, we created a phone stack. And I said, what's that? And they said, we put our phones in the center of the table, we stacked them up, and if you reached for your phone, you reached for the check. And she said it was the first time, first time we have had dinner where we weren't at all, you know, two or three of us texting and something else happened. All eight of us devoted our time. Now, you didn't have that issue 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And I think, you know, I go out to dinner, I see spouses, the man's on the telephone talking to somebody and she's texting or whatever. I'm thinking, what kind of, what kind of joy does that, that bring people? So I think it's always been tough. If you look at the, tr if you track happiness in terms of what it's been over the year, in general, it's been fairly constant in terms of the percentage of people that say that they're very happy. But I do think it's more difficult given technology of today's world. That help a little bit. Thanks. Who else has a question? Yes, please in the back. What's your name? I'm sorry. Good morning, William. William. Thank you, William. Good morning. Thank you. Congratulations oh. on your book. Oh, thanks. Sharing the content and especially sharing the family. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, William. And it might piggyback on what the other gentleman was asking you earlier. And I think in all in our culture, and each culture is different. And even starting with the Founding Fathers, where they put that sentence in there that uh, you know, we have the freedom to pursue happiness. Right. And I think what makes it so elusive, and, and even in some of what you shared, it seems like there's other things that have to be put in place before we're happy. Right. Oh, good. That maybe it's the food, it might be sex, it might be a movie. You know, let me do this, and maybe I'll feel a little bit of right. happiness. Right, right. But versus thinking about it as something we pursue, think about it as something that we're opening to, that it's something that's innate in who we are and what we're here for. Right. And that when we have that feeling or that need that we're missing something, that we have to be around a particular person or a, a particular right. environment to be happy, entertain the possibility that it's something in us that we can bring forth at any time, at any moment, in any situation. Uh, yeah, I think 
let me, if I could summarize real quick, I think what you're talking about is waiting to be happy as opposed to something that you already have inside. And, right, and it's, it's interesting because I've got a whole chapter devoted to all the ways I went astray. And one of them was what I call the when and if dead end, which is I'll be happy when my spouse treats me better. I'll be happy when I get the next job. I'll be happy when I graduate. I'll be happy when the kids leave home. I'll be happy when the kids come home. You know, it's always, we're putting it off. And I think it's not when or if, it's now. It's always inside you. It's always available to you. I had, um, the this, this students sign up and, and then they, I set, let in about 15 through a lottery and then people send me emails to get in and I sort through the emails. One year I'd let in 32 students and I didn't want to let it, I normally let 30 in, I didn't want to let any more in. And I get this three page email from the student and it goes on and on and on and about, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get to the last line of the email and she says, but Mr. Smith, whether you let me in the class or not, I will be happy. And I said, damn, I got a letter in the class. <laughs> she, knows, she knows happiness is inside. It's not for somebody else to give you, not for somebody else to bring to you. It's inside. You don't need to wait for somebody else. And I think your point is absolutely well taken. Thank you, William. Other thoughts? Yes, I'm part. Madam me. President. Yes. yes. Mastering our stories. Mastering our stories. Oh, good. This is, this is, um, this is a really important thing. Um, and this is great for you all that are students here to start thinking about this at an early age. You, your story is your life. Your life is your story. We tell ourselves stories. We normally think that this is the way the world works, which is some event occurs, and then we respond. So here's the event, and over here is our response. And we think that uh, what happens is um, we, we respond. I'm not a response. Uh, we respond. I guess that's the word. Um, we, we respond. We think it's the event. So if somebody cuts us off on the way to work, we are all angry and whatever else. Well, of course I'm angry. They cut me off. No, no, no. You're angry because you told a story. In between an event and a response is a story that you tell yourself. You're always te you tell yourself hundreds of stories a day. In this particular case, I've told the story. What a jerk. He doesn't care about a damn person. My wife would have a very different story. Gee, he must be really late for work and he's probably scared he's going to get fired. Or maybe his wife is sick in the, in the front right hand seat and he's trying to get to the hospital. She tells a different story. Our stories determine how we act, how we behave, and how we feel. They are very, very important to us. You have a voice up inside your mind, that's in your head, that's talking to you all of the time. And it's telling you stories from the second you get out of bed in the morning until the end of the day. Some people have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir up here. Oh, you'll be OK. Everything's OK. You know, don't worry about that. I have the opposite. I have this little devil up there that's saying things about me that I'd never let somebody else say. And it's saying things about other people that I would never, let, that I would never say out loud to other people. Here's what I'd like to do. Tomorrow morning when you get up, just start thinking about the voice that's inside of your head. Is it helping you? Is it telling stories that, you are, that are effective for you, that are going to get you where you want to get? Or is it always putting yourself down and putting other people down? I call mine Rex. I call this voice, it's getting crowded up here because there's me, there's this voice Rex, and then there's the other voice that says, hey, you don't have to listen to Rex. Rex is my reptilian brain you know, that's dri driven by fear, and I don't have to listen to it. I, I'm trying to become a master of my stories as opposed to a slave to the stories. Um, I've got a lot more in the book about it, but it's such an important uh, uh, thing to, to try to, uh, to practice. Um, I want to, uh, yes, please, one last question. Yeah, thanks. What's your name? Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn. Oh, yes, I signed your book. Yes, you're a DePaul graduate. My daughter's a Daughter's a DePaul graduate. Uh, question, have you done any studies like, around the brain? Because my daughter, for example, so it's two children. My daughter is the happiest person on the planet. She, yes. Her friends tell her she's the happiest person on the planet. Right. Versus my son just seems more like, you know, when I say normal or, you know, how you describe it. But how can someone have, you know, have that innate happiness? Right. It's just 19. Yeah. So, but, you know, since a young kid, right. she's, her friends have always told her she's the happiest person on the planet. Yeah. So how can two people be very different just from a, a, a genetic makeup? And genetics does make a difference in terms of uh, happiness. It's funny because my son, my, my hand, mentally handicapped son is the happiest person in the world. My other son is on the absolute end of the intellectual spectrum, really struggles with happiness. And um, I, I, I see it as well. There's a formula that people have, that uh, the positive psychologists have come up to, which is H is equal to S plus C plus V. And H, uh, uh, H equals obviously happiness. And S is equal to set point. There's a genetic set point. Just like anybody who's a great golfer 
might have a genetic predisposition for it. You've got a predisposition for happiness. You've got a predisposition for optimism and so forth. And in general, if I gave 1,000 people a questionnaire in terms of happiness, about 50% of their score would be, scores, average, would be made up by genetic makeup. Now, in this case, you've got the same parents working, but there's still a genetic makeup. It's your biological wiring. Are you more morose and you're more optimistic? Are you more extroverted and you're more introverted and so forth? So there's a genetic aspect. The second is circumstances. Whether you win the lottery, you get hit by the proverbial beer truck, what happens to you in life is circumstances. The incredible thing is circumstances is equal to about 10% of how happy you are. Not in the short term. In the short term, it can have an amazing effect, either positive or negative. But in the longer term, we're very adaptive creatures. We pretty much get back to where we were before. And the last is voluntary choices. So the first day of class, I explained this to students. I said, hey, the only thing you can do about set point is pick good parents. So there's nothing you can do about this one, OK? What we're going to talk about is voluntary choices, because they're the things that affect your circumstances. So what we're going to do is deal with the 50% of happiness that's determined by how you choose to, uh, to respond to things. Um, I just want to conclude. Thank you, Mary Lynn, for that question. Um, I want to close by the last chapter of the book, and it's called Call Me Mr. Call Me Mr. Lucky. Um, when I wake, here, here's a, tomorrow morning when you wake up, this is what you should do. You should wake up tomorrow morning, because I do this every morning, it's a great way to start the day. I throw back the covers, I look at my left foot, I look at the big toe on my left foot, and if I don't see a toe tag, I rejoice. <laughs> it's that simple. I know it's going to be a great day if I don't see a toe tag. By the way, I didn't share about my illness. I have been treated now for the past nine years. If you had to have this illness, you ought to be in Columbus, Ohio, or you ought to be in Houston, Texas. I live three miles from the hospital where people come from around the world. I've been treated for the last nine years with a thing called rituximab, which I get infused with. I go to the hospital, I get infusions, and I wait a while, and I get an infusion. Um, uh, most people, it works for a couple of years. It's worked for nine years for me. It stopped working now, but there's been so much progress on this illness that I'm five weeks into a trial. I'm the 40th person in the world to take this uh, drug. It's a pill I take twice a day. Hardly any side effects. The only thing, it's been tested on thousands of mice, and the only thing I've noticed so far is I have a fondness for cheese and peanut butter, and I tend, <laughs> and I tend to walk around the periphery of the rooms. Um, but it's, uh, I'm five weeks into it, and my, my, I'm very optimistic that this is going to be a way for me to uh, control this illness. And I'll be back here 20 years from now, and the president will be in the back drooling, saying, well, thanks, thanks, honey. So I'll be, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a joy to be here. I hope to be here a lot longer. I think my life is absolutely beautiful. I start my day that way, then I roll over and I say, call me Mr. Lucky, which is after this poster in Hanover, New Hampshire, to which my wife almost always responds, call me Mrs. Mrs. Lucky. I haven't been castrated, but I still think I answer to the name of Mr. Lucky. That voice that used to scream at me, that negative voice, that story that used to come at me, and that just barely whispers now. I go for a walk. If Gordy's not bagging the customers at uh, Kro Kroger, <laughs> Uh, he walks with me, we walk down, we work out, we come back. And I love my conversations with my son, Gordon. Sometimes during the day I call my son Greg. My conversations are very different, but they're no more or no less meaningful than the ones that I have with my son, um, Gordon. When I get home at night, we have dinner together. We watch something on TV. Lately it's been Dancing with the Stars. I think he likes Aaron on Dancing with the Stars. Uh, so we watch that together. He goes to bed. Sparky and I have about two hours before we finally rest. I finally put my head on the pillow. I uh, give thanks for the day and ask for forgiveness where I've come up short. I think my life is beautiful. It's simple, but it's beautiful. I think there's two reasons I believe my life is beautiful. The first is, what are the chances that these molecules or atoms would come together and form a living human being on the face of this earth? Earth. There are 30 sextrillion planets in the universe. 30 sextrillion. That's as many planets as there are cells in the human body of every living human being on the face of this earth. And we happen to be here on the one that provides life. It's an incredible, incredible occurrence to be here. We are an impossibility existing in an impossible world in an impossible universe. Why shouldn't we get up every morning and just be ecstatic that we're on the face of the earth? The second reason I believe my life is beautiful is because I decided it was beautiful. The second you decide your life is beautiful, a whole bunch of things usher in. You're not going to mess it up with a bunch of crap in terms of excessive alcohol or drugs or great commitments to other people or sex where it's not appropriate. You're going to take care of your body like you would any other. You're going to take care of your body, your mind, and your spirit like any other beautiful object. You're going to care for it and take, it, take advantage of it. Believing your life is beautiful is a fundamental decision of happiness, and it's available to every single person in this world. 
I've really enjoyed being with you all today. It's been a wonderful uh, conversation. I brought some books with me. You're welcome. You, you pay me 15 bucks. I turn around and give the money to, uh, to cancer research. Um, and you can also buy the book on Amazon.com if you'd like. Uh, but it's been an incredible joy to be here with you this morning. So uh, thank you very much for having me.